The new babysitter answered the door when I got to the Pellucci house. Hi, she said, extending one slender hand. She didn't look like much more than a teenager, maybe 18 or 19. She had red hair down to her shoulders, a freckled face, and large brown eyes. We shook hands. I'm Lance. Delilah, she said. Nice to meet you. The kids have told me all about you, she smiled. You're a cop, right? Yeah, a detective. Wow, she said, still smiling. Something struck me as false about her, a chord that thrummed in my gut, making me feel uneasy. I had seen that same look on the young woman at the Thai place when I was picking up dinner, and I'd seen a similar look on the young intern at the precinct. Okay, now I know it's me, I thought. I'm losing it, suspecting every young woman I see of... Of what? Nothing. I just need to relax. We moved into the house. I said hello to my old partner's family, his wife, Emma, and their two kids, Anthony and Anna. Bringing them food every Wednesday was the least I could do, since it was my fault their father had been killed. It wasn't much, but it was a way to ease my conscience. I set the Thai food out on the table, and we all sat down to eat. Oops, Delilah said. I forgot to call my mom and tell her I'd be eating here. Be right back. Don't wait to eat on my account. She got up and left the room, pulling her phone out of her capri pants. The rest of us dig in. The 12-year-old, Anna, dominated the conversation, often speaking with a mouthful of food as she told me about her week. Emma admonished her several times, but she kept doing it. I couldn't help but laugh. (laughs) She was so excited to see me and tell me about her life since I'd last seen her. She just couldn't remember to chew and swallow before talking. After about 10 minutes, I suddenly realized Delilah still wasn't back. I'd been so caught up in conversation with Anna that I hadn't given it much thought. I stopped chewing and looked around. Delilah? I called. Everything all right? Everything's fine, sorry. Be right there. She was on the opposite side of the house, it sounded like. I wondered what she was doing, but I kept eating. Several more minutes passed. Maybe it was the food in my stomach, but I was feeling drowsy. I could hardly keep my eyes open. My mind felt sluggish, and my limbs were heavy. All conversation had stopped. I looked over toward Anna, who was leaning back in her chair with her eyes closed. I'm tired. Anthony said, face scrunched up, head hanging down toward his plate. God, me too, Emma said, slurring her words. What's happening? Is there a gas leak? I looked down at my plate, with three quarters of the food gone. It's the food, I said with sluggish realization. Lurching up from the table, I knocked my chair over and barely kept to my feet. I swayed like I was blackout drunk, but I still reached for my weapon in my shoulder holster. Delilah! I cried, stumbling out of the dining room, knowing that she had something to do with this. Behind me, Emma tried to stand up but tilted forward, knocking her plate to the floor and shattering it. I swiveled my too heavy head that way, fighting to keep my balance and to keep my eyes open. Suddenly realizing what I needed to do, I reached into my pocket with my free hand, going for my phone. Delilah stepped in front of me, looking up into my face with those big brown eyes, those eyes that held a knowing smirk, a sinister spark. With a delayed realization of a head trauma victim, I noticed Anthony's metal baseball bat in her hands. She swung the bat at me. I tried to dodge and to get my gun up simultaneously, but whatever drugs had been in the food made both impossible. The bat struck my left temple and I went down hard. I stepped out of the car and onto the sidewalk on the suburban street. It was the kind of street you see in magazines, with the kind of houses you see on television. Everything clean and tidy, and held to exact standards by a Gestapo-like homeowners association. It was the type of neighborhood I used to want to live in, back in my younger days. But now, it only made me feel dirty, like I didn't belong, like I was an interloper in this suburban dreamscape. And in more than one way, 
I was. I didn't belong here. I only came to places like this when something terrible happened. Birds chirped in the branches overhead, and the sun shone down on the large trees. Dappled sunlight painted the ground. On a normal afternoon, you might see kids out playing, folks doing yard work, or friends sitting together on a porch, enjoying the spring weather. But today, the street was choked with police cars and crime scene tech vans. Soon, the county medical examiner would arrive. Neighbors watched from the other side of the crime scene tape with concerned looks on their faces. I scanned the crowd of onlookers as my partner, Rich Doherty, stepped out of the driver's seat of the car, stuffing the rest of his lunch into his mouth and dusting off his hands. Rich was a good homicide detective and a decent partner. He was the kind of guy who looked like your stereotypical cop. Thick mustache, slight beer belly, gruff demeanor, watchful eyes, and a cheap suit one size too big. Being a few years younger than him, I wasn't much better. I didn't have a mustache or a beer belly, but I figured both were no more than five years off. I had this theory that, after being a cop for so long, you just woke up one day with a mustache and a beer belly, even if you shaved the night before and had never had a beer in your life. It was an inevitability that the work would fully transform you if you stayed at it long enough. And each day I got up to investigate homicides, the closer I got to that point of no return. The problem was, I wasn't exactly sure I wanted to get to that point. The job was wearing on me in ways I'd never anticipated, and I was thinking of getting out. Rich swallowed his food and slammed his door. Let's do this, he said. We walked up to the door of the two-story craftsman and stopped briefly for another uniform to check us into the crime scene. We adorned booties over our shoes and pulled nitrile gloves over our hands. We stepped into the entryway, seeing several crime scene techs going after their various duties, taking pictures, dusting for prints, and gathering potential evidence. Up here, boys, a woman named Layla said from the top of the stairs. She and her partner had been the first uniforms on the scene after an anonymous tip had been called in. Layla, Rich said singing the famous Clapton song, just like he did whenever he saw her. Layla rolled her eyes, and I winced. What was it the kids said these days? Cringe? That was the perfect word to describe it. Reading the room, he knocked it off before we got halfway up the stairs. Thank goodness. Layla led us down the hall toward the main bedroom, stopping outside the open bedroom door. I immediately had a flashback to a case I'd closed two years ago the biggest case of my life, and the one during which my old partner had been killed. It was a case I had barely survived, having almost eaten my service weapon three times in the months after my old partner's murder. Now, as I looked into the bedroom, at the random patterns of blood all over the floor, at the position of the body, and at the victim's blue eyes, I went lightheaded. I turned away from the door, faced the wall, and closed my eyes. Jesus! Are you okay? Layla asked. When I called this in, I told them to warn you about the similarities. They warned me, I said, eyes still closed. I'm fine. I'm fine. Swallowing, I opened my eyes and turned to face the murder scene again. The victim was a woman, late 40s, sprawled on the bed with her head positioned at the foot, hanging off to face the door. Her eyes and mouth were open allowing me to see the piercing blue of her eyes and the fact that her tongue had been cut out. She wore colorful yoga pants and a tight tank top, as though she'd been working out or had just come home from the gym when the killer assaulted her. If this was a true copycat, there would be no evidence of sexual assault. The fact that the woman was fully clothed was just another factor that made me think this murderer had studied the Hush Killer case. Although I would wait until the autopsy to come to any conclusions, it looked as though the woman had been killed by puncture wounds on either side of her neck. I took a step forward and looked up at the ceiling, seeing the large hook that I figured would be there. The hush killer would tie his victims up, cut out their tongues, install a hook into a beam in the ceiling, and then hoist them up from their feet. After that, he would stab them with an ice pick on either side of their neck 
and pushed them around, swinging them from the hook while the blood drained out of them, making random patterns on the floor and any furniture that happened to be around. Once the victim died, he would get them down, untie them, and then arrange them in such a way so that they were looking toward the door of the room with their bright blue eyes. All his victims had striking blue eyes, both men and women. The only victim of his who didn't have blue eyes was my old partner, Joe Pellucci. The Hush Killer, his real name, Donovan Paul Blakely, had likely targeted Joe because he felt we were getting too close to catching him. Maybe he thought Joe would make us think twice about going after him. If so, he was dead wrong. After that, every cop in the state had been looking for him. Maybe he just knew his time was up and that a cop would make a great final victim, even if it broke from his modus operandi. Either way, we never had a chance to interview the guy because I blew his brains out as soon as I caught up to him. You don't kill a cop and get to spend the rest of your life in prison, filing appeals and enjoying three hot meals and a cot. That's just not the way things work. And I don't regret my decision to kill the guy. I only regret not being able to get to him before he killed Joe. Let me guess, I said, still staring at the dead woman. No one saw anything. I still got some guys out there talking to neighbors, but yeah, no good news yet, Layla said. Where's the husband and kid? I asked, having clocked the family pictures downstairs on an entryway table. Some kind of school trip, according to the calendar on the fridge downstairs, Layla said. We haven't called the husband yet. I can do that if you want, Rich said. We sure that's the same woman who lived here? I asked. Yeah, Layla said. I found her ID in her purse and checked it. It's her. We always liked to be 100% sure before we notified next of kin. So I nodded and turned to Rich. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind calling him, that would be great. Thanks. Sure thing, Rich said. He and Layla walked down the hall so she could give him the husband's phone number. Meanwhile, I stepped into the room, doing my best not to trample on the blood, although it was dried into the carpet by now. I started going through my process, pulling my small pocket-sized notebook out and taking notes as I moved around the room. By the time I was done taking in the scene, I knew this copycat was good, very good and I had no doubt in my mind that this guy would keep killing until we stopped him. Rich and I left the neighborhood after dark. We had talked to the immediate neighbors, trying to get something from them, but there was nothing there, at least nothing that would help us yet. Still, this was the early stages of the investigation, and we were gathering as much information as we could so we could put it all together later. That doesn't mean I wasn't disappointed. I was. No one remembered seeing a strange vehicle in the neighborhood on the day of the murder or in the weeks leading up to it. Of course, there were things like delivery trucks, HVAC vans, plumbers, cleaners, and the like. No one ever gives much thought of those types of vehicles, so I figured it likely the killer had something like that. Maybe even just a couple of magnets with a made-up company name on them he could slap on his van, truck, I got a list of company names from the neighbors, which Rich or I would call to see if they'd had anyone in the neighborhood leading up to the time of the murder. I wasn't hopeful it would lead to anything, but this was the job, putting the pieces together until we could see the whole picture. As we drove back to the precinct, we heard a call come through on the radio. It was a unit dealing with a domestic disturbance and they were asking for backup. Since it was right around the corner from where we were, Rich and I decided to take the call. We pulled up to the small ranch-style house, seeing the single police SUV outside with the lights flashing. In the front yard, two uniformed officers were busy trying to keep a man and woman from fighting each other. The woman was in handcuffs, but the man wasn't. Still, it was clear that the two young uniforms were having trouble controlling them. So Rich and I jumped out and ran up to help. Rich headed for the woman and I headed for the man. Both of them were large people, outweighing the officers by a good 40 or 50 pounds. They were screaming at each other, and the presence of two more police officers did nothing to calm them down, at least not at first. Finally, after threatening to arrest both of them, we got them to calm down. 
but we still couldn't get them to go back inside. So we all stood on the front lawn and tried to figure this thing out. The one uniform next to me, Snyder, said that the woman had struck her husband with a closed fist shortly after they'd arrived. Okay, I said to the husband, Roy. So here's the deal, Roy. You can press charges against your wife. If you do that, we'll take her in and book her, and she'll eventually be given a trial date. In this state, she'll have to stay in jail until her trial date, unless you post her bail. That sounds like an awful lot of trouble for one little punch. And between you and me, if you send her to jail, you'll probably want to file for divorce too. Because if you don't, I can almost guarantee she will when she gets out. Is that what you want? No, Roy said, still glaring at his wife, Alexis. I don't want to press charges. I didn't like the way he was looking at his wife. But before I could think of what to do, Snyder called over and said, Uncuff her. He's not pressing charges. He fucking better not be, Alexis snarled. He started the whole goddamn thing. He's always starting it. But when it comes down to it, he's too scared to hit me because he knows I'll beat his ass. You, shut up if you want to stay out of jail tonight, Rich said as the other uniform uncuffed her. The couple stared at each other for a long moment. Are you going to be adults about this? I asked. Because if we get called out here again tonight, you'll both be going to jail and neither of you will have a choice in the matter. I'm ready to be an adult, the man said. His gaze hadn't left his wife. I still didn't like it, but then again, I never liked domestic violence calls. They rarely ever ended well in the long run. Fine, Alexis said. Okay, Rich said, releasing the woman. She started moving toward the house. Thank you, officers, Roy said. Then he headed toward the house as well. As he and the woman neared each other on the front lawn, Roy glanced over his shoulder. Our eyes met, sending a jolt of dark static through me. He was reaching toward the front waistband of his jeans, and that look in his eyes spelled violence. I bolted toward him before I knew exactly what I was doing. Things seemed to go into slow motion as I ran, yelling automatically for him to drop it. I had no idea what it was until he turned to face his wife, and I glimpsed the small knife blade. He slashed at his wife's face, and I was too far away to stop it. Roy dragged the blade savagely down her face, opening a gash and tearing through her left eyeball. Alexis screamed and tried to pull away, but Roy was readying for another attack, and this time it looked like he was going for her throat. I crashed into him before he could use the blade a second time. We went down hard, and suddenly the uniformed officers were around me, helping me subdue and cuff the man. Rich was kneeling next to a collapsed Alexis. He radioed in an ambulance. You didn't fucking check him for weapons? I asked when we got him under control. Roy lay face down on the ground. Snyder knelt on his back to keep him from moving. I did, Snyder said. We checked them both. He didn't have anything. He looked at the knife on the ground, seeing that it did appear to be oddly shaped. I picked it up and quickly realized why. It was specially designed to fit into Roy's belt. The handle was the buckle, and the blade could be hidden in the belt itself designed for just that purpose. Wincing, I looked over at Alexis. She screamed and cried and gripped her face. He'd done some serious damage. And the belt buckle knife would be evidence to help the prosecutor put him away for assault with a deadly weapon and attempted murder. An ambulance showed up after a few minutes and took Alexis to the hospital. Several other units showed up, along with a lieutenant. After doing our due diligence and documenting everything, Rich and I followed with the belt knife and an evidence bag. When we got back to the precinct, Rich stopped me in the parking garage just outside the elevator. Go, he said. I got this. I'll get started on the murder book, okay? I hesitated. There's too much work to do, I said after a moment, shaking my head. Come on, man. There's not much more to do until we get the autopsy results. All the businesses are closed for the night. All we need to do is start the murder book, and I can handle it. Go bring them dinner. You're going to be late. Are you sure? I said. You don't mind? Hey, Rich said, grabbing my shoulder. If something happened to me, God forbid, but if something did, and I left a wife and kids behind, I would want somebody to check on them. You know what I mean? It's a good thing you're doing it. So go do it. I'll see you in the morning. Yeah, I said. Okay, thanks. 
I handed Rich the evidence bag with the belt and hidden knife. He said he'd check it into the evidence room. I headed back out into the parking garage toward my personal car, hearing the elevator doors shut behind me as Rich went up to the bullpen. It was Wednesday, and I always brought dinner over to the Pellucci house from a little Thai place on Bowers Street. I called the order in before I got to my car and then headed over. As I waited inside the restaurant, mouth watering from all the delicious smells, I noticed a new face, a 20-something woman with short blonde hair and green eyes. She brought my food out to me, smiling. There you go, detective. Thanks, I said. I'd been stopping in every Wednesday for nearly two years, so most of everyone knew me. It wasn't a surprise to hear her call me detective. I guessed they had got her up to speed on all the regulars. 20 minutes later, I arrived at a split level in a lower middle class neighborhood. The lights were on and I could hear the television going as I stepped up and rang the doorbell. Emma Pellucci answered the door, looking as good as ever in skinny cargo pants and a short sleeve pullover top. She had her dark hair pulled into a ponytail. Hey Lance, wasn't sure you were going to make it tonight. Almost had to throw a pizza in the oven. Yeah, sorry, I said. Caught a case. She stepped aside and let me in. Sup, Lance? Anthony, the 14-year-old, said from the couch. He was watching some superhero movie while simultaneously staring at his phone. Hey, buddy, I said. Dinner's here. Be right there, he said, typing on his phone. Anna, the 12-year-old, was sitting at the dinner table, fork and knife in hand, ready to go. I'm so hungry, she said. I laughed. (laughs) Sorry, but it's here now. I got the order out of the bags and set the containers on the table. Pretty soon, we were all delving in. As was always the case when I spent time with the Paluchis, a sense of calm came over me as I ate. The kids told me about their week. When they were done, Emma told me about how things were at the hospital where she worked. The stresses of the world fell away, allowing me to relax and forget about all the evil I saw. It was just about the only thing that kept me sane. I needed those dinners more than the Paluchis did. Of that, I was sure. I didn't have a family of my own. I probably never would. So this was as close as I was going to get. Even back before Joe was murdered, especially back then, the Pellucci place was like my second home. Shortly after Joe and I had partnered up, he invited me over for dinner on a Wednesday night. I volunteered to bring food. At first, Joe refused but I insisted. So I stopped at a little Thai place that was a hidden gem and brought the food. After that, it was a tradition. Every Wednesday, Joe and his family invited me into their home, welcoming me like a member of the family. Then there were weekend barbecues and picnics and school plays, and even weekends at the lake in a cabin they rented every summer. I would have given anything to be sitting there with Joe again, anything. But I couldn't change the past no matter how much I wanted to. I couldn't change what that monster had done to Joe. Putting Donovan Paul Blakely down like the dog he was gave me some small consolation. I just wished I could have done more. I wished I could have caught Blakely earlier. As I sat at the table, eating and talking, the sense of comfort I'd felt seeped away, replaced by the images of that woman, Sharon Tillman. Her blue eyes staring at me as I stood in the doorway, her gaping, tongueless mouth, the puncture wounds at the base of her neck. Was this a second chance? Was this God giving me an opportunity to catch this copycat killer before he could do any more damage? I hoped so. But something else gnawed at me as I tried to push away the thoughts of work. What if it was punishment for murdering Donovan Paul Blakely? What if I couldn't catch him? What if he went on to kill more people even than Blakely did? Get this, Rich said, hanging up his phone. Our desks were pressed up against each other so we were face to face. I stuck my finger up on my own phone call. It was clear Rich was onto something, so I thanked the plumbing company I was on the phone with and hung up. They'd already verified they had someone working down the street from the victim's house on the day of the murder. What's up? So, Rich said, face animated as he leaned his elbows on his desk. The neighbors saw a van from a cleaning company Two houses down the day Mrs. Tillman was killed, right? Sure, I said. Dream clean, right? 
Exactly. But I just got off the phone with them. They didn't have anyone dispatched to the neighborhood that day. The nearest cleaning team was in Forest Hills. But that's not all. He trailed off, prompting me to take up the thread. Let me guess. One of their vans was recently stolen? Rich slapped his desk. That's exactly right. And they gave me the license plate and VIN number, along with the make, model, and year, of course. I smiled. Let's get an APB out. I'll write it up now, Rich said. Uh, excuse me. I turned to see a new intern, a shy, mousy woman in her early 20s with plain features and pale brown hair. She stood next to my desk with a pen and a small notebook. I couldn't remember her name, so I just raised my eyebrows. Did either of you guys want coffee? She asked. I'm making a run down the street. I'm good, I said. Trying to cut back. How about you, Rich? I'll take one. Black and large. Rich dug a $5 bill out of his wallet and handed it to the young woman. Thanks, Georgia. You're welcome, Georgia said, taking the five and shuffling off to take orders from the other detectives in the bullpen. We watched her go. I don't know how she'll ever make it in law enforcement if she doesn't get over that shyness, I said. Rich shrugged. Maybe she's trying to be a lawyer or something. This will look good on her job applications. Even then, she'd never make it as a trial lawyer. Not like that. It was nothing more than a passing observation, but one that I would come back to later, when everything went to hell and I was thinking about eating a bullet again. Funny how different things are in hindsight. Rich and I pulled into a dirt lot next to a set of train tracks in the early evening. There was a police cruiser parked behind a white panel van with the Dream Clean logo painted on the sides. A uniformed officer leaned against the cruiser, straightening up as we pulled into the lot. We parked behind the cruiser and got out. Hey, detectives, the uniform said. He was a young guy, black-skinned and muscular. Officer, Rich said. You checked the VIN against the one in the APB, is that right? Sure did. That was the only thing I did. Didn't open the doors or touch anything. And when I checked the VIN, I tried not to mess up any footprints around the van. There's a lot of them. How'd you come across this? I asked. Well, it's the damnedest thing. I always eat my lunch here in the lot. I got the APB just before I stopped to get my sandwich. So it was still fresh in my mind when I pulled in here and saw the thing sitting there like it was a present for me. Rich and I nodded. It was a good break. We'd only put the APB out this morning, and now we had the van. I was starting to feel hopeful that we would tie up this case quickly. We turned and saw a crime scene vehicle pull up into the lot behind us. Thank goodness. I wanted them to get their stuff done on the outside, like recording the footprints in the dirt so I could open up the van and see what was inside. Rich and I stood back with the uniform and watched as the techs did their thing. Daylight was fading fast when the guys gave us the go-ahead to open up the van. Wearing gloves and booties, we moved to the back doors. Rich reached out and tried the right-hand door. It's unlocked, he said. I pulled my firearm out just in case and got it ready. Then I nodded and Rich pulled the door open. Jesus Christ, I said. Damn it. A woman's body was directly inside the van door. Somehow, she'd been affixed chest up to the ceiling in such a way that her head hung down, facing the right-hand door so it would be the first thing anyone would see when opening it. Her blue eyes seemed to pierce me, causing me to stumble back. Rich pulled the other door open, bringing enough light into the cargo area of the van to illuminate the abstract blood painting on the ridged white floor. It was only when he stepped in front of her that I managed to snap out of it. As Rich checked the woman for a pulse and found none, I moved closer and peered into her mouth, verifying that her tongue had been cut out, just like Sharon Tillman's had. Donovan Paul Blakely had reportedly eaten the tongues, but we were never able to prove that. It was simply something he said in one of his cryptic messages to the press. We certainly never found any of the victim's tongues at his house except for Joe's. He still had Joe's. It was in a plastic baggie in his refrigerator. He wanted us to find this, I said to Rich as we stared at the woman. She was younger than the first victim, early thirties, petite, with blonde hair. 
She was dressed in tight shorts and a t-shirt with the sleeves cut off. As I knelt outside the van and looked up, I saw that the killer had drilled through the ceiling of the van, and then he ran wires up through the holes, securing them to the luggage rack up top. Then he put the woman's limbs through the wires, knees, upper thighs, and upper arms. The woman had thrashed so much that the wires had cut deep into her flesh. He must have gotten her up there when she was unconscious, Rich said. Then she woke up and started trying to get free, and the wires just cut into her. God damn, what a sick fuck. He wanted us to find this, I said again. Which means I doubt we'll get any usable prints or DNA, son of a bitch. We both stood up and told the shocked crime scene techs that they could get to work processing the interior of the van and taking pictures so we could get the poor woman's body down. As we stood to the side in the fading daylight, watching the techs work, Rich spoke. Let's check every single house with a doorbell camera on that road. Surely one of them got the van driving around. That's a well-off neighborhood. I bet they have good doorbell cameras. I bet we can get a look at the son of a bitch. I nodded. It was something. The next week passed with excruciating slowness. We ran into dead end after dead end. First, after nearly two days of looking through video footage from the doorbell cameras on Sharon Tillman Street, we found some usable footage with the right angle for us to see who was driving the van. But it wasn't a man. It was the dead woman from the back of the van, a woman who we so far had no leads on identifying. There had been no purse in the van, no wallet or credit cards, or other identifying documents. We ran her prints through APHIS, but got no results. We compared her to recent missing person reports in the state and still came up empty. Next up was checking dental records, but I knew that could take a long time. There's no national database of dental records, so you have to know where to look to ask for them. In the meantime, we had an artist do a drawing of her and started disseminating it to local news stations. The woman's prints were all over the cab of the van, which was to be expected since she'd been the one driving. At first, we thought maybe she was an employee of the cleaning company, but no one recognized her, and the manager said that all her employees were present and accounted for. Of course, there were no other prints inside the van, other than those belonging to an actual employee, a middle-aged woman who had used the van last before it had been stolen. We checked her out just to be sure, and found that she had a solid alibi for both murders. Besides, Women serial killers are rarer than honest politicians. Our working theory was that the killer had abducted the Jane Doe from somewhere and forced her to drive to Sharon Tillman's house. Since there was a small door connecting the cargo area to the cab of the van, the killer could have been sitting in the back, pointing a weapon at the woman. It seemed risky though. It was clear from the Jane Doe's time of death that she'd been killed a full 24 hours after the first victim, Sharon Tillman. So he had to have knocked her out somehow or kept her bound in the back of the van so she wouldn't get free while he killed Tillman. Risky, but not impossible. And clearly, whatever he'd done had worked. The only solace I had as the days passed without a solid lead was the fact that no more bodies showed up. But for all I knew, there were several more dead people out there, blue eyes open, staring into nothingness, waiting for me to show up so they could pierce me to my core with their accusations. As I sat at my desk in the bullpen, staring down at the murder book, going over it again and again, Georgia stepped up beside me and cleared her throat. I rubbed my eyes and looked up at her. What's up? Do you need anything before I leave? She asked. Leave? Oh shit, what time is it? I spun around to look at the wall clock. My phone was buried somewhere under the mess that was my desk. It was 15 till seven. I shot up from my desk. It was Wednesday and I was going to be late for dinner again. Uh, no, I'm good, I said to the intern. But you may want to ask Rich. I think he went to the bathroom. Ask me what, Rich said, walking into the bullpen. Do you need anything before I leave? Georgia asked as I pulled my suit jacket on and dug around for my phone. No, I'm good, thank you. I'm about to get out of here myself. Got a hot date. And I do mean hot. I paused long enough to look up at Rich. You do, huh? Is this a new one? 
Is she a badge bunny? Yeah, I just met her the other night. I don't care if she's a badge bunny or not. I just hope she's a rabbit in the sack, if you know what I mean. Rich paused, suddenly remembering George's presence. We both looked at her. She was smiling uncomfortably, but she wasn't blushing, which was kind of a surprise. I figured her for a blusher. Uh, sorry, Georgia. Guy talk, Rich said. That's okay, she said in her small voice. Good luck on your date. Rich guffawed. Thanks! See you both tomorrow, I said, patting my pockets to make sure I had everything as I headed for the door. As I went, I saw I had a text from Emma Pellucci. She said she invited the new babysitter to stay for dinner and asked if I would get enough food for her to eat too. I messaged back that I would. I called in the food order on my way to my car in the parking garage. When I got to the place, I only had to wait five minutes. The new employee, the young blonde woman with green eyes, brought it out to me. Enjoy, detective, she said. I suddenly realized that there was something familiar about her. It only took me a moment to place it. She reminded me of Georgia. They both had a similar kind of secretive look to them, as if they knew something the rest of the world didn't. After so many years as a detective, I'd gotten good at reading people. But I was surprised when the similarities between the two women struck an alarming chord deep in my gut. Normally, I would have chalked that knowing look up to youth not yet tainted by the world, but not tonight. I watched the woman walk back toward the kitchen, feeling kind of ill. Before she moved through the kitchen doors, she glanced over her shoulder at me with a small smile on her face. Then she was gone, and I was walking out of the restaurant, trying to shake off the feeling. But even after I got into my car and headed toward the Pellucci house, I couldn't get the young woman's smile out of my head. It wasn't a pleasant customer service smile. There was something wicked about it, something cruel something sinister. I hadn't been sleeping well, working 16 hours a day since last Wednesday. Maybe I was just too out of it. I needed to eat a good meal, relax with the Paluchis, and then get a good night's rest. The new babysitter answered the door when I got to the Pellucci house. Hi, she said, extending one slender hand. We shook hands. I'm Lance. Delilah, she said. Nice to meet you. The kids have told me all about you. She smiled. You're a cop, right? Yeah, a detective. Wow, she said, still smiling. I got that uneasy feeling again as I recognized something in her smile. Why did she remind me of the woman from the Thai place and Georgia? Okay, now I know it's me, I thought. I'm losing it. Suspecting every young woman I see of... Of what? Nothing. I just need to relax. We moved into the house. I said hello to everyone and gave Emma a hug. Then I set the food out on the table and we all sat down to eat. Oops, Delilah said. I forgot to call my mom and tell her I'd be eating here. Be right back. Don't wait to eat on my account. She got up and left the room, pulling her phone out of her capri pants. The rest of us dug in. Anna dominated the conversation often speaking with a mouthful of food as she told me about her week. After about 10 minutes, I realized Delilah still wasn't back. I'd been so caught up in conversation with Anna that I hadn't even given it much thought. I stopped chewing and looked around. Delilah? I called. Everything all right? Everything's fine. Sorry. Be right there. She was on the opposite side of the house, it sounded like. I wondered what she was doing, but I kept eating. Several more minutes passed. Maybe it was the food in my stomach, but I started to feel drowsy. I could hardly keep my eyes open. My mind felt sluggish and my limbs were heavy. All conversation had stopped. I looked over toward Anna, who was leaning back in her chair with her eyes closed. I'm tired, Anthony said, face scrunched up, head hanging down toward his plate. God. Me too, Emma said, slurring her words. What's happening? Is there a gas leak? I looked down at my plate, with three quarters of the food gone. It's the food, I said, 
remembering the look on the blonde woman's face as she went back into the kitchen. Lurching up from the table, I knocked my chair over and barely kept to my feet. I swayed like I was blackout drunk, but I still reached for my weapon in my shoulder holster. Delilah! I cried, stumbling out of the dining room, knowing that she had something to do with this. Behind me, Emma tried to stand up, but she toppled forward, knocking her plate to the floor and shattering it. I swiveled my too heavy head that way, fighting to keep my balance and to keep my eyes open. Suddenly realizing what I needed to do, I reached into my pocket with my free hand, going for my phone. Delilah stepped in front of me, looking up into my face with those big brown eyes, those eyes that held a knowing smirk, a sinister spark. With a delayed realization of a head trauma victim, I realized she had Anthony's metal baseball bat in her hands. She swung the bat at me. I tried to dodge and to get my gun up simultaneously, but whatever drugs had been in the food made both impossible. The bat struck my left temple, and I went down hard. Consciousness came back slowly, in ragged pieces that melded with the nightmare world I still had one foot in. It was bright wherever I was. I opened my eyes, finding that I was still inside the Pellucci house, still where I'd fallen on the floor after Delilah hit me with the baseball bat. With my head swimming and limbs still heavy, I pushed off the floor and got to my knees. Emma, I said, looking around. There was no sign of anyone. The plates from the night before were still on the table. Leftover food was still adorning them. I got to my feet, groaning and gripping my head at the pain. Emma? Anthony? Anna? Nothing. No sound. The house felt empty. The morning sunlight streaming through the windows made me wonder what time it was. I searched for my phone but couldn't find it. Then I saw my pistol on the floor. I bent down to grab it, my head hammering. Panic started filtering through my drowsiness. They were gone. They'd been taken. I knew it, but I still searched the house, looking in every room, finding them all empty. My heart hammered, my palms grew sweaty, and my thoughts only repeated the worst possible outcomes. I kept picturing Emma and Anna and Anthony dead, their eyes open, staring at me. I needed help. It was all I could think of. But I had no phone. There was no landline in the house. But I still had my keys. I ran outside and got into my car. I reached for where the radio would be in my unmarked police car. But I wasn't in my unmarked car. I was in my personal vehicle. So I started up the engine and tore down the street, heading for the precinct. Panic jumbled my thoughts and prevented me from keeping my cool or falling back on my training. I couldn't let anything happen to Emma or Anna or Anthony. But for all I knew, they were already dead. I couldn't bear the thought. Instead of pulling into the parking garage, I pulled up out front, leaving my car illegally parked as I jumped out and ran into the lobby. Help! I need help! There's been a kidnapping! The desk sergeant ran up to me, calling for assistance on his radio. Calm down, detective, he said. Just tell me what happened. Several other officers came down to help. Most of them had either known Joe Pellucci directly or had known of him. So when I told them it was his wife and kids that had gone missing, it was all hands on deck. A couple of units raced over to the Thai place, even though it was barely nine in the morning and it wouldn't be open for another two hours. Several other units raced over to the Pellucci place to start the investigation. Meanwhile, I was brought upstairs to the detective's bullpen. Many of the detectives had already gone over to the Pellucci house, leaving only a few behind. They stood nervously near their desks, watching me walk into the room. I passed Georgia on the way in, sitting at her little desk at the corner of the bullpen. She looked up at me, and I did a double take, seeing that her normal doe-eyed look was gone. She was smirking. Breaking free of my friend and fellow detective named Jeff Levine, I lurched over to her and slammed my hands on her desk. What the fuck are you smirking about? Did you have something to do with this? Her smirk was gone, if it had ever been there at all. And she recoiled from me, face twisting into a frightened sneer. Whoa, Lance, what the hell are you doing? Levine said, grabbing me and pulling me away. What happened? Georgia asked in her small, innocent voice. Levine ignored her, 
and I let it go. I had no evidence against her, nothing but a gut feeling. Levine shoved me into my desk chair and pulled up a seat beside me. Tell me exactly what happened again, from the beginning. The other three detectives and my lieutenant gathered around to listen. I opened my mouth, then stopped, peering around the bullpen. Where's Rich? I asked. Levine looked at me impatiently. He hasn't come in yet. What do you mean? I asked. He always gets here at eight, always. Well, when you both didn't show up, we figured you were out working some angle. I remembered Rich saying something about a date with a new woman. Oh, no, I said. Oh, please, no. Not again. What? What is it? Call him, I said. Call Rich, right now. Seeing the seriousness on my face, Levine nodded, stood up, and pulled out his phone. The other detectives gave him some room, then started pelting me with questions as Levine moved absently over toward George's desk, phone pressed to his ear. I stared at him for a moment, hoping he would get Rich on the phone and that everything would be fine. But after several long moments, I dropped my head into my hands, knowing that Rich wouldn't pick up. He couldn't. Detective! Georgia screamed. I pulled my head up and looked over at her. She stood behind Levine, up on her tiptoes, so she could press the blade of a box cutter to the detective's neck. The room went preternaturally silent as everyone tried to process this turn of events. Levine had his hands up, his phone still in one of them. I could barely hear the tinny voice asking him to leave a message on Rich's voicemail. Levine's eyes were wide and fearful. Put your hands down, she said to Levine. That smirk was back on her face. Put them down or I'll open your jugular right now. She pressed the razor blade into his neck slightly, drawing blood to demonstrate her seriousness. Levine dropped his hands. Despite their difference in size, I didn't think there was anything Levine could do to get free. Not without her cutting deep into his neck first. She had her back facing the corner, so it would be impossible for someone to come up behind her. What are you doing, Georgia? I asked, getting to my feet. What is this? This is true power, she said. Now tell them to put their weapons down. I looked behind me to see that the other detectives all had their weapons out and pointed at Georgia. They're not going to do that. I said, you know they won't do that. She shrugged with one shoulder. I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm just here to deliver a message to you, Detective Lance Watkins, and to the world, so they will know his name. Whose name? I asked. What are you talking about? He holds true power in his hands, Georgia said. And his name is Azrael. The cords of her forearm flexed as she jammed the blade deep into Levine's neck and dragged it under his chin in a practiced and powerful motion. Blood spewed from the wound. Georgia shoved Levine away, who stumbled to the floor, clutching at his throat. And the next instant, a gunshot sounded from next to me. Georgia twitched as a bullet wound blossomed in her chest. Then there were another dozen shots, fired not out of some sense of threat, but out of anger and vengeance. Bullets smashed through the young woman's body. She fell to the floor, dead, but still clutching the box cutter. No! I screamed, but it was far too late. We would never get any useful information out of her now. I ran over to Levine, kneeling in his blood on the tile floor, and tried to staunch the flow of blood, but it was no use. His pulse faded less than a minute later. I knelt on the floor next to Levine's lifeless body, staring into his bright blue eyes. Of course he had blue eyes. Of course, because this was all one big fucking joke. One big sick joke pulled by someone named Azrael. Chaos swirled around me as the entire precinct came into the bullpen, drawn by the gunshots and the quickly spreading news that a cop had been killed. I was the only one who paid any attention when Levine's phone, which lay nearby on the floor, started ringing. The caller ID said Rich Doherty. Hope came flooding into me as I yanked the phone off the floor and answered. Rich, tell me you're okay. Rich is with the angel of death, a man's voice said in a smooth and snake-like baritone. And so are the Paluchis. You, Detective Lance Watkins, are the only one who can save them. He paused. Are you listening? I plugged my other ear with a finger. I'm listening. Just tell me what you want. Good detective. Here's what you're going to do.
After what I'd seen and what I knew, there was only one explanation for what was happening. And as I drove out of the city, heading to where the man told me to go, I had a good two hours to think about it. The man, who I assumed was Azrael, told me I was not to bring a phone. He said that if I brought a phone, he would kill little Anna first, slowly, in front of her brother and mother. I had no way of knowing how he would be able to tell if I had a phone, but I wasn't willing to risk it. So as I slipped out of the bullpen amid the chaos, I left Levine's phone behind, repeating the directions the man had given me in my head. I made one stop at the evidence lockup before going out to my car and speeding out of the city as fast as I could. So although I had no phone to do research on, I knew that I was dealing with a Manson-like cult. This man, Azrael, had convinced his followers to infiltrate the police station, the Thai food restaurant, and even the Pellucci's life. Maybe they had even done the murdering for him. Maybe he hadn't killed anyone by his own hand. Of course, he'd made it clear that he had someone else in the police station who would know if I alerted anyone else about the situation. The threat was similar. If he found out I had involved anyone else, he would kill Anna. Or if Anna was already dead from my refusal to come without a phone, then he would kill Anthony. Again, I had no way of knowing whether he actually had someone else in the police force, but I didn't want to risk it. I had no choice but to do what he wanted. So when I arrived at my destination just after 11 a.m., I did exactly as he told me. The area was in the middle of a forest at the end of a dirt road. I stopped my car at the dead end, shut off the ignition, and stepped out, keeping my hands up. Four young people, two men and two women, all of them dressed in tunics and light cloth pants, came out of the trees, pointing rifles at me. One pair took me aside, the woman pointing a rifle at me and the man searching my clothing. The other pair searched my car. When they were satisfied, we all got into my car and they told me to drive back down the dirt road. We drove for nearly an hour, going deeper into the forest until we came to a locked gate. One of the young women got out and opened the gate. After I drove through, she locked the gate behind us and then got back into the vehicle. After driving slowly through a thick stretch of trees, we came out into a primitive compound with wooden shacks, small fields of crops, and what looked to be a large wooden church. People dressed in simple tan-colored tunics and pants stood outside the church in two orderly rows flanking the entrance. They stared at my car as we approached. Stop here, the man in the front seat said. I stopped where he said, just beyond the lines of people, and we all got out of the vehicle. I scanned the staring cultists for weapons, realizing that they all held small knives in their hands. Go, the guy said, shoving me in the back. What are the knives for? I asked, resisting. I had only the barest inkling of a plan, but it would all go out the window if these people were going to stab me as I made my way to the church. The blades were all small, but there were enough of them to do me some serious damage. I counted 24 people, men and women. Just go, the guy behind me said, shoving me again. As I stepped forward in between the two lines of people, they all raised their hands straight out in front of them, like soldiers on parade. I flinched, thinking they were going to come at me, but they didn't. Instead, they all used their knives to cut small gashes on the backs of their forearms. They started a low chant as they did this, speaking words I couldn't understand as they sliced and then bled, keeping their arms held out and their faces passive. I stared at these people, at the blood running down from their minor cuts, thinking this wasn't real. People didn't do things like this in real life, did they? But of course they did. Nearly a thousand souls knowingly drank poisoned flavor punch at Jonestown. The Heaven's Gate people killed themselves so they could be taken to the next life on the hale Bop Comet. And perhaps most famous of all, Charles Manson's followers killed people for him because he'd brainwashed them to do his bidding. But it was different seeing it up close. It made my head swim and my guts go watery. And I knew the worst was yet to come. The chanting grew louder as I approached the closed church doors. 
It was loud enough that it seemed to vibrate the ground under my feet. As I stepped up onto the front terrace, the church doors opened, revealing more identically dressed men and women filling the pews. They were all chanting, and they had all cut themselves. There had to be a good 200 of them. As my eyes adjusted, I saw five people up on the stage. On the left was Rich, tied to a wooden cross that hung on the wall. On the right, Emma, Anna, and Anthony were all tied to similar crosses. Between them, in the middle of the stage, was the man I took to be Azrael. In my head, I'd been expecting a bearded man with fiery eyes and an imposing figure, but what I saw looked more like a diminutive accountant than a hippie prophet. That's not to say he wasn't imposing. His presence seemed larger than life, but that could have been an impression I got thanks to the show of power he'd just demonstrated by having his people cut themselves and chant. Azrael wore bright red and orange robes and stared at me with dark, deep-set eyes. He was deeply tanned and his head was shaved to the scalp. He smiled knowingly at me, the same kind of smile I'd seen on the followers' faces back in the city. When he raised a hand, the chanting stopped and everyone sat down. My escorts prodded me to the foot of the stage and then forced me down onto my knees, so I was staring up at Azrael. Detective, he said, you made it. Welcome to my flock. I said nothing, turning my gaze toward Emma and her kids. The children were crying against the gags in their mouths. Emma pleaded with her eyes for me to do something, anything. Why? I asked, turning back to Azrael. Why are you doing this? The man smiled wider. There comes a time in every leader's life when he must do whatever it takes to get his message across. Because if he doesn't, not enough people will hear it. This is the world we live in, detective. It's not my fault that people only listen to you after you've done something so heinous and terrible that they have no choice but to open their ears. But why me? Why them? I pointed my chin at the Paluchis. Detective, you are famous, don't you know this? You took down the Hush Killer. As soon as I saw you on television, I knew you were the one. I knew you would be my conduit to the rest of the world. I shook my head. Fine, I'm here now, you have me. You can let them all go and do whatever you want to me. Azrael's laugh filled the high-ceilinged room. <laughs> His followers laughed along with him, mechanically, like pull-string dolls. <laughs> I'm afraid you're a package deal, he said when he was finished laughing. You're going to be even more famous because of me. But fame must be earned, and earning it is difficult. Movement caught my eye to the right. I looked that way and watched a man with a camera come near, clearly recording. On the other side, a woman with a camera walked up on stage and started filming Rich. I looked over my shoulder to see a third videographer recording from behind. It's time for you to earn your place in history, Azrael said. Our names will be forever connected from this day on. And although I doubt either one of us will leave this compound alive, we will be immortal. My story will be told again and again, and because it will, yours will be too. You will be a supporting character, but it's better than obscurity, don't you think? Just get on with it, I said. I'm so sick of hearing you drone on. Rage flashed on the cult leader's face before he caught himself, glancing sheepishly at the nearest camera. Don't push me, detective, he said. I can make things much harder on your young friends behind me. I can take fingers and toes until you learn manners. I said nothing, feeling more and more sick to my stomach with every passing moment. <clears throat> Azrael cleared his throat, recentered himself, and then glanced around the room. A benevolent smile was now on his face. When he was sure he had everyone's full attention, he put his gaze back on me. You have to choose, detective, who will live and who will die. Your partner, your ex-partner's family, you have to. Rich, I said, interrupting him. 
Kill Rich. Let the other ones go. That rage came back onto his face again. This wasn't going the way he'd planned. Maybe he knew the way his followers would react to a given situation, but not me. And maybe, just maybe, if I could get him mad enough, he would slip up and give me an opportunity. You don't want to think about this? Azrael asked, sounding a little less in command. You asked me to choose, and I chose. I couldn't look at Rich, who was yelling against his gag and trying to free himself. Now let's get it over with. Go ahead and kill him. I looked down at the floor. The room was silent for a long moment. Then Azrael spoke again. I'm afraid it's not so easy. You see, I'm not going to kill anyone. You are. No, I said, looking up at him with a shocked expression. You can't make me. Azrael grinned, back in control, confident again. If you don't, we'll start with the children and we'll make it slow. You've made your choice. Now it's up to you to save their lives by killing your partner. He gestured at the nearest armed guard, who pulled me to my feet and shoved me toward the stairs on the left side of the stage. A second guard followed, both of them covering me with their semi-auto rifles. A cameraman followed closely, filming the whole thing while the other two camera operators got different angles. The other two guards, the two women, stayed near the bottom of the stage, standing with their rifles held at the ready. My two escorts stopped me in front of Rich. He was tied to the cross up off the floor, so I had to look up slightly to meet his eyes. He shook his head, pleading with me against his gag. I'm sorry, I said. I turned to Azrael, who was standing a safe distance away, watching intently. Don't I get a weapon? I asked. A knife or something? Do you think I'm a fool? Azrael said. I'm not giving you a weapon. You can use your hands. Choke him or suffocate him. You do not get a weapon. As I turned my head to look back at Rich, I let my eyes drag over the rifle in the nearest guard's hands. The safety was off. The rifle was ready to fire. If I made a move now, I would be shot. There was no doubt in my mind. Do it. Azrael said. I reached up and gripped Rich's neck, feeling the tendons flex under my fingers. I squeezed, knowing that I only had one shot, and if I didn't take the chance, we would likely all die. I knew there was no way he would let Emma and the kids go. This was his final act, his grand finish. He'd been planning this for two years, ever since I put down the hush killer like the dog he was. Now I had to do my best to put down another dog or die trying. Rich's face changed colors as I choked him, turning to a deep red and then tilting toward blue. I sobbed and averted my eyes and kept squeezing. Then I dropped to my knees, letting Rich suck in a breath around his gag. I can't do it, I cried. I doubled over on the floor, reaching one hand toward the knife concealed in my belt buckle. I had grabbed the belt from the evidence room on the way out of the precinct earlier knowing that it could be my only chance. Finish it! Azrael shouted. I can't do it! I can't! I sobbed, gripping the buckle knife, pulling it out, waiting for the right moment. Get him up! Azrael said. We'll make him watch as we take a finger from the little girl. Then we'll see if he can do it. The guard from my right stepped over and grabbed my upper arm. I let him yank me up as I pulled the blade out and slashed at the man's throat. I reached for the gun at the same time, grabbing it as I dragged the blade across his neck, tearing through skin and muscle and veins and tendons. I yanked the gun out of his grip with my left hand, spinning around and whipping the stock out at the other guard, catching him in the head as he raised his rifle to fire. The impact knocked his head around, but it didn't get him off his feet. Azrael screamed as I dropped the knife and got the gun in both hands, pointing it at the recovering guard and pulling the trigger, shooting him in the upper chest. Chaos erupted in the audience with the gunshot. People scattered, running for the doors. I dropped to one knee and fired at one of the female guards just as she fired at me. I felt a bullet strike my upper left arm just before she went down with a hole in her head. I turned toward the other female guard and fired, hitting a man who was running past. My next shot got her in the stomach and she went down screaming. Now that the most immediate threats were eliminated, 
I turned to look for Azrael, but he was gone. I scanned the crowd, which was quickly dwindling as people ran outside, but saw no sign of his bright robes. I fired several more times over the people's heads, making sure none of them would come at me. Ignoring the pain blossoming in my arm, I grabbed the knife off the floor and quickly cut Rich free from the cross. He immediately went and got the second guard's gun and said, Get them free! I'll cover you! I hustled over and freed the Paluchis. Let's get you the hell out of here! I said. Rich and I moved off the stage. I picked up the rifle next to the shot woman and removed the magazine, pocketing it, and then ejecting the round in the chamber before tossing the rifle aside. Rich did the same thing with the last rifle. We approached the door carefully, peering outside. The only people we saw were running away. I told the Paluchis to stay put while Rich and I moved outside and took up position next to my car. When I was confident the coast was clear, I waved the Paluchis out and then opened the back door to my car. Once I got them inside, I moved over to Rich, pulling my key fob out and handing it to him. Get them out of here safely, I said. No way, Rich said. You're coming with. We'll bring the entire police force back out here and find that fucker. I shook my head. It'll take too long. He'll be long gone by then. I need to end this now. You've been shot, Rich said, gesturing at my arm. I looked down at it. It's not bad. Glancing shot. I'll be fine. Rich stared at me, saying nothing. Please, just get them to safety, I said. I got this. At the very least, I'll keep the bastard busy until you bring the troops, okay? Reluctantly, Rich nodded and got into the car. Then he stood back up and handed me the spare magazine. Be careful. I took the magazine and nodded. Then I watched as Rich drove the Paluchis away. The three of them stared out the back window at me. I waved once and then turned and hustled back into the church. To the right of the stage was a door. It was the only place Azrael could have gone. I kicked the door open and cleared the room, seeing that it was a large space with a plush bed, a couch, and a desk. Thick curtains adorned the walls, and there were shackles attached to each corner of the bed. There was no sign of Azrael, so I moved around the room, pulling the sound dampening curtains away from the wall. There were no windows and no other doors. It was a dead end. What the hell? I said, looking around. I started my search again, looking carefully at the panels behind the curtains. It didn't take me long to find the hidden door because, in his haste, Azrael had left it open just slightly. I pulled the hidden door open, revealing a wooden staircase going down into the earth. I moved down the stairs carefully, ready to fire the rifle if I saw the cult leader. There was a light on at the bottom of the stairwell, which illuminated part of a shaft that looked like an old mine. The walls were stone and dirt, with support struts and beams every 10 feet or so. The light only reached so far into the tunnel before darkness took over. I peered into the darkness, trying to see what lay ahead. For all I knew, Azrael could be down there with a rifle, waiting for me to step fully into the tunnel before firing. With the light overhead, he could see me, but I couldn't see him. So I decided to level the playing field. I reversed the rifle and smashed the light bulb, plunging the tunnel into complete darkness. I stood next to the doorway, listening and waiting for my eyes to adjust. When I could see as well as I was going to be able to see, I stepped into the tunnel and moved up to the nearest beam at the wall, which provided some small amount of cover. I couldn't see more than six feet in front of me, so I half expected to see a muzzle flash from up ahead as Azrael took a shot at me. But nothing happened, so I moved diagonally across the tunnel, hustling to the next beam. I waited. Nothing happened. I repeated the process again, but when I moved a third time, I recoiled and nearly fired the rifle as a figure came into view at the side of the tunnel. I quickly realized it wasn't Azrael. It was a young woman who was strung up between two beams. Her arms and legs were held in cuffs attached to the beams on either side of her. Her head hung down, greasy hair covering her face. She was dressed only in underwear and her skin looked dirty. I wondered how long she'd been down here as I reached one hand out to check her pulse. As I touched her neck, her head shot up and she screamed and thrashed. The suddenness and ear-piercing loudness of her screams had me backing away before I realized what was happening. 
Her screams served as a cover for the sound of footsteps rushing toward me. Azrael appeared from further down the tunnel, no longer dressed in his robes, but instead in simple pants and a shirt like his followers. I turned toward him, trying to get the gun up, but he was launching toward me, a curved blade arching toward my head in his right hand. Acting instinctively, I brought my left hand up to ward off a killing strike. The knife caught me on the other side of my left forearm, tearing a jagged cut through my flesh up toward the inside of my elbow. The pain didn't register at first because Azrael followed through with his body, smashing into me and sending me crashing into a beam at the side of the tunnel. The impact was enough to knock the beam down, which caused the cross beam at the ceiling to fall, hitting my right arm and causing me to drop the rifle as I fell to the ground. Although there wasn't immediate pain, alarm bells jangled in my head because of the severity of the cut. I knew I was bleeding badly, but any concern about the cut was quickly overshadowed by more insistent alarm bells as Azrael came at me again. I grabbed the beam that had fallen on me and thrust it at the man, knocking him back just long enough for me to grab the rifle. I aimed the weapon at him and pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. Azrael came at me again, leaving me no time to figure out what was wrong with the weapon. So as he came near, I jammed it barrel first up into his throat. It was a lucky shot, hitting him in the windpipe. He stumbled back, pulling in a choking, whistling breath. The woman had stopped screaming, but now she shouted at me. Shoot him! Shoot him! Still choking, Azrael charged me again. I pulled back on the charging bolt, clearing an upsent round out of the chamber and loaded another one. As the cult leader closed the distance, the blade coming toward my chest, I pulled the trigger. The noise of the gunshot bounced off the walls as Azrael stabbed the blade into my upper chest, but his strength wasn't in it. He stepped away from me, leaving the blade sticking out of my flesh and looked down at the blood spreading from the bullet wound just below his rib cage. Looking shocked and still pulling in pained whistling breaths, he stumbled drunkenly over toward the woman. The woman saw him coming she slammed her head forward, headbutting Azrael and sending him to the ground, where he writhed and struggled to breathe for about a minute before going still. Gripping my left forearm at the elbow, I got tenderly to my feet, groaning at the pain in my upper chest from the knife. I moved to the woman, thinking I would be able to free her, but I didn't have my handcuff keys on me. I could feel myself getting lightheaded, so I said, I'll come back for you. I need to take care of these wounds and find a key. Is he dead? She asked, staring down at Azrael. I stepped over and kicked him in the head. There was no response. He was gone. Yeah, he's dead. Please hurry, she said. Don't leave me down here for long. I grabbed the rifle just in case and stumbled back down the tunnel, making it out into the church before I collapsed. I wasn't going to make it. I'd lost too much blood. But then I heard the most beautiful sound in the world, followed quickly by seeing the most beautiful sight in the world. A convoy of police vehicles rolled up outside the church, containing at least two ambulances. Thank God, I said, sitting in the middle of the aisle and looking out the open front doors as the cavalry arrived. Several officers and two paramedics raced toward me. I told the officers about the woman down in the tunnel while the paramedics started doing their thing. Then I passed out. The Paluchis visited me in the hospital the next day. The first thing I said to them was, I'm sorry. For what? Emma asked, sitting beside my bed and taking my hand. You saved us. And don't even think about saying anything about how we wouldn't have been in that situation if it wasn't for you. That's bullshit and you know it. Sorry, kids. Anna and Anthony grinned at their mother's coarse language. The only reason we were there was because of that psycho Azrael, Emma continued. That's it. So there's nothing to be sorry about. If anything, I should be sorry for hiring that babysitter. Worst babysitter ever. We chuckled at the remark. <laughs> That young woman had been rounded up at the cult compound. The DA was looking at charging her with attempted murder, kidnapping, and a whole host of other crimes. When you get out of here, can we do Wednesday dinners again? Anthony asked. Sure, I said. Of course. Great, Anthony said. But maybe it's time to try a new restaurant. Thanks for listening.
If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.